Les Brown with the Earth Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, how's humanity doing? <laughs> At least we're here to ask the question. That's the good news. Um, I think we're in trouble, and probably more trouble than most people realize. We look around the world, and we look at the environmental trends that, that I've been tracking for decades now. Um, deforestation, soil erosion, aquifer depletion, collapsing fisheries, grasslands turning to desert. I mean, you go down the list, CO2 levels rising, temperature rising, ice melting. Um, we've not turned a single one of these trends around. There is one trend we did turn around, and that was actually a few decades back, and, and, and that was the, um, the use of the chemicals that were depleting the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that were depleting the stratospheric ozone layer. That would have been dangerous. We got that trend turned around. We quickly phased out the use of CFCs and found substitutes that worked uh, equally well. Um, but with these other trends, we've not turned one of them around, and we know from studying the archaeological sites of earlier civilizations that when, when they got on, um, moved on to an environmental path where they were destroying their natural support systems, their forests, their soils, or what have you, that it was only a matter of time until they declined and eventually collapsed. No civilization has ever survived the ongoing destruction of its natural support systems, nor will ours. And if you think about it and you look at the trends, it's, it's obvious that we can't keep uh, disrupting and destroying a na our, our natural support systems, but we are. And the question is, can we get these trends turned around? What sort of a wake-up call will it take? Um, and can we do it? in time. For example, can we know that if, if the Greenland ice sheet melts, the sea level rises 23 feet. What we don't know is where, the, where the, the point of no return is. At what point will we not be able to save the Greenland ice sheet regardless of what we do? We don't know where that is. Nature sets these uh, establishes these thresholds, sets these deadlines, if you will. Uh, nature is the timekeeper, but we can't see the clock. So we don't know how much time we have left to arrest the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. So it's, it's, a, it's a time of great uncertainty, and the impressive thing is how little we know about some of the most important trends that are undermining our future. So it seems like my generation, like when I describe this movie to people, I say, you know, it's a movie about how humans are going to survive the next hundred years. And everybody under 35 says, you know, yeah, right, we're not, or something to that respect. It's mm -hmm. like people are starting to understand it's a bigger issue than just sea level rise now. But why isn't anything happening? Well, I, I, I've, I've had a similar situation even with my the generation before yours. Um, I, I meet uh, friends and sometimes they say, how are you? And I say, I'm fine. It's the world I'm worried about. Aren't we all, is the sort of typical response. So I think people have, I think most people now, regardless of age or generation, are beginning to sense that the future is not looking very promising. And, uh, but it's not, it's not clear how we go from where we are to, to getting things turned around, exactly what's required and how much time we have. It seems to me like, you know, buying Priuses and changing light bulbs isn't going to do it. It's like, it looks like most of our civilization is built upon destroying the world we depend on for survival, our economy and all of that. So to turn that around is going to mean a, like a shift of monumental proportions. No question. Um, and I think the key to restructuring the global economy, to get off the current decline and collapse path onto one where we can sustain um, 
uh, the economy and, and our way of, way of life in the future um, really depends on, on a rapid restructuring of, of the world economy, importantly the energy economy. And I think the key to that is restructuring the tax system, that is lowering income taxes and offsetting that with a rise in the carbon tax. We won't change the amount of tax we pay, we'll just tax labor less and tax carbon more. That will automatically begin to affect decisions across the board, whether it's consumer decisions or whether it's investment banks or corporate planners or government policy makers. We all are economic decision makers and we all respond to market signals, i.e. prices. And what we now have is a market that's not telling us the truth. It says burning coal is cheap, when in fact burning coal is very costly because if you include the costs of climate change along with the cost of mining the coal, then you can see how, how uh, expensive it is. Um, similarly with burning gasoline. I mean, some people are moving toward more fuel efficient cars. Priuses are selling very well. Uh, now, um, but it's, it's still a very small segment. But if we get the market to tell the truth, then we can see things begin to change. The problem is our accounting system doesn't, uh, doesn't tell us the truth. It reminds me a bit of, of Enron. Um, during the 1990s, Enron, a Texas-based company, Houston-based to be precise, was probably on the cover of more business magazines than any other corporation in the country. It was extraordinarily successful, it was sort of the darling of Wall Street. Um, its stock was selling for over $90 a share. And then some people began raising questions and some outside auditors began looking at Enron's books. And what they discovered was that Enron was bankrupt. Its stock dropped from $93 a share to pennies per share almost overnight. And what had happened was that the, some of the employees at Enron had devised some rather ingenious ways of leaving costs off the books. We're doing exactly what Enron did but on a far larger scale we're leaving costs off the books. And that's, that's the danger we face. So the challenge is to get the market simply to tell the truth, to um, have in effect full cost accounting embedded in the price system. And we can do that by restructuring taxes. So it's, it's doable. We know how to do it. It's not as though it's a great mystery and we can't figure out how to restructure the economy. We, we do. The challenge is mobilizing the political will to do it. Now, if, if a civilization were to collapse, there'd be some clear things happening, like people would be starting to run out of food. You know, are, is this happening now? For a long time, I rejected the idea that food could be the weak link, could be the weak link in our modern civilization. But several years ago, I began to rethink this a bit. And not only do I now think that food could be the weak link, I think it is the weak link in our modern civilization. And we see evidence of that. Um, I worked in agriculture uh, during the latter half of the last century. and. It was a period dominated by surpluses and excess production capacity. The U.S. Department of Agriculture used to pay U.S. farmers a, a certain to, to not plant a certain percentage of their cropland. And, and in exchange for that, they would be guaranteed a, a support price for their wheat or corn or soybeans or whatever. But we don't have that idled cropland anymore. We're flat out. Um, we don't have excessive stocks of grain anymore, surpluses as we call them. 
I remember 1965, there was a monsoon failure in India. We shipped a fifth of our wheat crop to India to avoid famine. Not a big deal. We had plenty of wheat. Um, but now we're in a situation where we don't have the surpluses. We don't have the huge stocks of grain. We don't have the idled cropland. And we're seeing the, the growth in demand for grain um, moving at a record pace. It used to be population growth. And then it became population growth and rising affluence. Today there may be three billion people trying to move up the food chain, consuming more grain intensive livestock products. So we're adding 80 million a year, which means there'll be 216,000 people at the dinner table tonight who are not there last night, and again tomorrow night. And, and that puts relentless pressure on the world's farmers. So we have population growth, we have rising affluence, and in recent years we've seen the massive diversion of grain to the production of fuel for cars, particularly in the United States. In 2010, we harvested 400 million tons of grain in the U.S. Of that, 126 million tons went to ethanol distilleries to produce fuel for cars. So we've set up this competition now between, between automobile owners and people competing for the world grain supply. The problem with that competition is that the, the average in, income of an automobile owner in the world is in the vicinity of $30,000 a year. But the average income of the poorest people in the world is, is more like $3,000 a year or less. So the competition is not, a, not even by any means. So on the demand side, population growth, rising affluence, using grain to produce fuel for cars. On the supply side, we now have climate change. Agriculture as it exists today um, evolved over an 11,000 year period of rather mark, <clears throat> sorry, evolved over an 11,000 year period of rather remarkable climate stability. There were a few little blips here and there during the period, but basically was quite, climate was quite stable. Now the climate system is changing. It used to be we had a monsoon failure or a drought or a heat wave in some major food producing region and things would tighten up for a bit, but we knew they would go back to normal soon. Now there's no norm to go back to because the Earth's climate is in a constant state of flux and change. Each year, the agricultural system and the climate system are more and more out of sync with each other. Because remember the agricultural system we now have evolved in response to a particular climate system, which is now changing. But we can't change agriculture that fast. And we don't know exactly how to change it because we're not sure exactly how climate is changing and is going to change. So, this is sort of a difficult thing to measure, but each year now, the agricultural and the climate systems are going to be more and more out of sync with each other. Um, we have a rule of thumb that crop ecologists use for measuring the relationship between rising temperature and yields, which is that for each one degree Celsius, rise in temperature during the growing season, we can expect a 10% decline in grain yields. Now that's fairly precise, but the climate effects go far beyond temperature. It has to do with rainfall and, and uh, 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 everything from humidity, which affects crop diseases, to, uh, to drought. Everything is going to be more extreme now, that we know. Um, uh, more destructive storms, more destructive floods, more uh, intense droughts and, and heat waves and so forth. So we've got a problem. The second thing that's making it more difficult for farmers to meet the record growth in world demand for grain is water shortages. Half of us live in countries that are now over pumping aquifers 
that is pumping underground water faster than it recharges through precipitation um, in order to keep up with the growth and demand for food. Um, among these countries are China, India, and the United States, the big three grain producers. Overpumping aquifers is not such a big deal for the U.S. because only a fifth of our grain harvest comes from irrigated land to begin with. But in India, where it's three-fifths, or in China, where it's ne nearly four-fifths, losing irrigation water is, is a big deal. So what we have done in these three countries and another 15 or so countries is we have created water-based food bubble economies. That is, we've kept expanding irrigation and grain production by overpumping. And you can overpump in the short run, but not in the long run. At some point, as a result of overpumping, the aquifers are depleted. At that point, the pumping is necessarily reduced to the rate of recharge. So we have production going like this and then coming down. And we don't have a good sense of exactly when these will be kicking in. We know that in Saudi Arabia, um, which was self-sufficient in wheat production for more than 20 years, um, because they were pumping an underground aquifer, which happened to be a fossil aquifer, that is, it didn't recharge. They found this aquifer about a half mile down with their oil drilling technology. So they were going along very nicely, self-sufficient in wheat production, more than 20 years, and then suddenly they announced that their aquifer was largely depleted. They were going to phase out wheat production, and that began in 2008, and in, in another couple of years, they'll probably be out of wheat production altogether and will be totally dependent on imports. Now, they only produce 3 million tons of wheat to begin with. The world harvest is just over 600 million tons. So 300, losing 3 million tons is not the end of the world. But it is an example of what happens as a result of overpumping them. And it's going to happen in some bigger countries. The World Bank, for example, um, data show that 175 million people in India are being fed with grain produced by overpumping which by definition is a short-term phenomenon. Uh, in China, we estimate that 130 million Chinese are being fed with grain produced by overpumping. So we have climate change and we have coming water shortages. We're also seeing an enormous loss of cropland to non-farm uses. We see this in the Central Valley of California, in the Nile River Basin, in the North China Plain. China, China's new car sales this year will probably total 20 million. The highest ever in the U.S. was 17 million, and this year will probably be something like 13 million. The problem with adding 20 million cars to your fleet is that you have to pave land, roads, highways, parking lots. 20 million cars takes at least a million acres of paving. And a lot of the land that will be paved is cropland. So we have this loss of land. We also have a situation where in a number of more agriculturally advanced countries, farmers have caught up with the scientists. In Japan, for example, where rice yields started rising more than a century ago, they've been flat now for 16 years. After going like this, no increase at all. And it's not that the Japanese farmers don't want to raise their yields. They would, they would very much like to because they have a support price that's three times the world market level. So it would be a very profitable thing to do. The problem is they're using all the available technologies. They, they look to the scientists, and the scientists don't have any new technologies for continuing to raise rice yields. Same is true for wheat yields in France, wheat yields in Germany, wheat yields in the UK, where for the better part of a decade now, there's been no, no rise in yields. They've plateaued. China, whose rice yields are now just catching up with those of Japan, 
and I don't think they'll ever go much higher than Japan, is also facing the prospect of its rice yields plateauing. If that's the case, and, and the rice harvest in Japan and China will not be expanding much, if any, in the future, it means a third of the world's rice harvest is being produced in countries where there's no growth, no future growth in prospect. So we're looking at, on the supply side, climate change, we're looking at um, the, um, the spread of water shortages, the loss of irrigation water supplies. We're looking at um, a situation where farmers are catching up with scientists in more and more countries. On the demand side, population growth, plus rising affluence, plus the use of grain to fuel cars. And we've got a problem. And this is why, in 2007, grain prices started rising and are now more than double the historical levels and will probably continue to rise. We saw a huge stock drawdown in 2010, partly as a result of the heat wave in, in, in Western Russia. Um, but we've also... Um, Sorry, let me start that again. We, we saw a huge reduction in the grain harvest in Russia in the summer of 2010 as a result of heat, intense heat, record heat, and drought. Temperatures over 100 degrees in Moscow never experienced before. In addition to that, or as a Partly as a result of that, world grain stocks were drawn down very substantially in 2010. 2011 was to be a year to rebuild grain stocks. Prices were very good in the spring at planting time, and farmers intended to plant a lot. But all kinds of weather events have gotten in the way. Drought in the southern Great Plains, especially in Texas. Record rainfall in the northern Great Plains and the Corn Belt, so farmers can't get the spring wheat planted, can't get their corn planted. Um, and we're seeing drought in, in Europe, drought in China. And suddenly, it's becoming clear that we're not going to rebuild grain stocks in 2011. Um, and in fact, they're probably going to be drawn down further, which means then that the earliest relief we can hope for is in the harvest in 2012. But I sense that this is the beginning of a tightening of the world food supply. And if I, <clears throat> if I were to pick three trends that I think will tell us more about our future than perhaps any others, the first would be an economic trend. What's happening with grain prices? The second would be a social trend, the number of hungry people in the world. That's a trend that during the, the closing decades of the last century was declining. And then as we came into the current century, it started to rise and is now over a billion people and is climbing. It was down as low as 825 million, has been climbing, is over a billion now, and looks like it's going to continue to, to climb. And we now know that rising food prices are a, um, a source of political unrest in, in many countries in the world. The, the third trend that I think we should watch is a political one, the number of failing states in the world. The list of failing states is now getting longer year by year. And incidentally, the term failing states only came into our vocabulary you know, 10 or 15 years ago. This is not a long-standing thing. But that list of failing states is now getting longer each year. And it raises a disturbing question, which is how many failing states before the whole system begins to unravel? We don't know the answer to that. We haven't been here before. Um, but these are the three trends that I think are worth watching. Grain prices, number of hungry people in the world, and the number of failing states in the world. We went to the climate conference in Copenhagen and saw you know 100,000 people hit the streets trying to say, we want better climate protection, and not only did nothing happen, but like the country that I'm from, Canada, was the most violent oppositionist to anything happening. 
We went back to Canada, saw the tar sands, and figured out the Canadian government is putting more than a billion dollars a year into exploiting oil, a hugely destructive resource. Like how, it seems like the fact that we have these mega corporations at, you know, in it with the government is is sort of taking everything out of control. If we can get the market to tell the truth and reflect the full costs of getting the oil out of the tar sands in, in the Athabascan region of Canada, <clears throat> then that oil will become so costly we probably won't want to use it and we'll begin looking at electric cars and building wind farms and running our cars on electricity, for example. If we can get the market to tell the truth, a lot of these things will begin to take care of themselves. But that's, that's the big challenge right now. Um, in terms of corporations and government, it, it seems like the fact that they're together is a major issue in this, and that's continuing to try to push our economy to grow further, to try to you know extract even the last bit of resources out of everything. Corporations, even well-intended corporations, can never stray far from the bottom line. They have to deal with market prices, not with real prices, what I would call real prices, that is the full cost of pumping oil and refining it and burning it and the cost of climate change and so forth. Um, so the, the challenge is to, if we can get the market to tell the truth, we won't have to worry about that corporate government relationship because they will be responding to market signals that will say it's time to invest in efficiency. It's profitable to invest in renewables now, not in coal or oil. Is there like one thing you'd want the <coughs> sort of entire public to know about this that could help turn it around? One of the uh, things I've done over the years is try to try to see how social change comes about, and I have sort of three models that I use. One I call the Pearl Harbor model, where you have uh, a dramatic, traumatic event that changes everything. Another model I call the Berlin Wall model, where you have pressure building in a society for change and suddenly you reach a tipping point and the Berlin Wall coming down was the visual manifestation of a political revolution in Eastern Europe that changed the form of government of every country in the region. And essentially without bloodshed, and we did not see it coming. Um, I had another example there. Um, we've seen this with cigarette smoking in the United States, for example. Um, we've seen dramatic change, um, and that came about as a result, again, of government released reports, Surgeon General's report on smoking and health year after year and generating a lot of studies and news coverage of these studies linking smoking and health and finally we hit a tipping point and everything changed. Um, <clears throat> the third model has been labeled the sandwich model where you have support from cha for change from the grassroots welling up from underneath and support for that change at the top. Um, that's how we got, um, that's why the civil rights movement in the first half of the 60s was able, you know, from the first march in Selma or wherever until the Voting Rights Act was signed, it was just a matter of years because we had support at the top and we had uh, uh, an upwelling of, of, um, of energy from, from below. Um, so those are, the, those are the ways that social change comes about. I go back to the Pearl Harbor model, literally, because in 19, the, the Japanese attacked the U.S. Pacific Fleet, part of which was at anchor in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. It was a surprise attack and a very successful one. I mean, in, in, in military terms, they, they literally wiped out a, a, a big part of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, which happened to be at anchor there. January 6, 1942, one month later, 
President Roosevelt gave a State of the Union address in which he laid out U.S. arms production goals. He said, we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, and literally thousands of ships. And people couldn't relate to those numbers. They were so beyond arms production numbers that anyone else had ever, uh, had ever seen anywhere in the world. I mean, it was a huge effort that Roosevelt was talking about. After he laid out these production goals, and because he and his colleagues knew that at that time, the largest concentration of industrial power in the world was in the U.S. automobile industry, he called in the leaders of the industry and said, because you guys represent such a large share of our industrial capacity, we're going to rely heavily on you to help us reach these arms production goals. And they said, in effect, well, Mr. President, um, you know, we're going to we're going to give it everything, but it's going to be a stretch producing cars and all these arms, too. What they did not realize was, was that Roosevelt was about to ban the sale of new cars in the United States, period. They had no place to go but to produce tanks and, and, and planes and, and so forth. And we exceeded every one of those arms production goals. The point of this example is that it didn't take decades to restructure the U.S. industrial economy. It didn't take years. We did it in a matter of months. And if we could do that then, imagine what we could do with the energy economy, the world energy economy, if we got serious about it. Well, where do you find the greatest amount of hope in all this? Huh? One of the interesting things in thinking about social change is societies reach tipping points. And tipping points, by definition, are difficult to even define or, an or anticipate. But we know they, they happen. After the Berlin Wall came down, the White House called in the, the intelligence agency leaders and said, how come you didn't tell us about this? Not only did the intelligence community not anticipate the Berlin Wall coming down and everything that symbolized, but they had trouble explaining it after it happened. And, and that's one of the interesting things about tipping points. I mean, who among us at the beginning of 2011 saw the Arab Spring coming. You know, and yet, it's, it's happening. What the outcome will be remains to be seen, but, but huge change coming in a part of the world that's been, been successfully re resisting change for generations now. So we may be approaching one of these tipping points, and at some point, things will begin to change at a rate and a pace and in ways that we cannot even now imagine. And, and that is, is my hope for, for the future, that we'll reach a point where we realize that we're going to have to change a lot of things very fast, not in decades necessarily, but maybe in a few years and, and in a matter of months even. It seems to me looking at potential collapses like lots of animals go through boom and bust cycles. Like the Canadian lynx we have in our movie, every 14 years all the lynx die because they've eaten all the hares. And looking at collapses in the past, it seems almost every time humans have been pushed into this kind of situation, we've ended up like eating each other. You know what I mean? How, how, how are we not like paying attention? Or why are we not seeing where we're going? <clears throat> For one thing, it's very difficult for us to imagine experiences we've not had before. Um, and this is the case with the decline of civilization. We've not had a decline of civilization in, in modern times. In fact, a long, it's been a long time. And, and you have to almost go back to when civilizations existed in isolation from each other in various parts of the world, the Sumerians or the Mayans or what have you. Um, but we are now part of an integrated global society. 
a global economy. We're tied together. And we're either going to make it together or we're going to, we're going to fail together. But one of the things to keep in mind is that we have a very complex global economy now um, with a lot of specialization, with a lot of sort of just-in-time um, delivery systems. If you were to look at the average city in the United States and look within its boundaries to see how much food there was, maybe three days, I mean, it was a threat of a snowstorm or a hurricane or something. Store shelves can empty out, you know, in a day. And if there was ever anything to disrupt that flow, a breakdown of the international financial system, so you couldn't, that would disrupt the transactions that move commodities around and, 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 and food products. Um, so we've, I think we've, become comfortable with sort of an unwritten assumption that, you know, it may have happened to them, the Sumerians or the Easter Islanders or the Mayans or what have you, but it won't happen to us. But we are very vulnerable. And once things begin to unravel, uh, it might not be possible to, to arrest that process. Well, what happened with Easter Island? Well, in Easter Island, they, um, um, they, they build a flourishing uh, sort of small society there. Um, they uh, use the trees. I don't remember exactly when the Easter Islands were uh, settled, but probably uh, go back more than a millennium till the first people reached Easter Island. The population grew. Um, and they, um, there weren't a lot of fish right around the island, but there were good fisheries not too far away. So using the trees, they built these boats where they could get out and even get to dolphins and other um, uh, species that provided uh, uh, a lot of food. But then over time, as the deforestation of the island progressed, because they used wood for fuel, then finally there were no big trees left. And they couldn't reach those prime fisheries that had been sustaining the growth of their population. And so suddenly, um, if, if you go through the archaeological sites, you see that uh, in going down, um, that you know, far down there were bones of fish and dolphins and so forth. And then suddenly, at some point, they start mixing with human bones. And the reason was cannibalism. Um, that was the only survival option that was left when they, after they cut down all their trees and could no longer reach their prime fisheries. Now, you say, did they know what was happening? They must have had some sense if they, you know, if they were losing their trees, eventually they'd lose their boats and couldn't reach their prime food supply. But they weren't able to do anything about it. And in a sense, we, we know. It's not as though we don't know what's happening in the world. We have an enormous amount of data on everything from soil erosion to, to climate change. Um, and we know what needs to be done about it. We know how to conserve soil. We know how to stabilize climate. But the question is whether we can mobilize the will to do it. And we always talk about our leaders, but our leaders reflect us in many ways. Uh, so it's really up to us. And my sort of concluding thought is that whereas we environmentalists have for decades now been talking about saving the planet, but as I think about it, the planet's probably going to be around for some time to come. The real issue now is saving civilization itself. And that's not a spectator sport. We can't just sit around and hope someone's going to do it. We all have to get involved. And by getting involved, I don't mean just changing our light bulbs and recycling our newspapers, though those are important. We've got to change the system. We've got to restructure the world economy. And we have to do it quickly if we want to have any hope of sustaining civilization. I've not talked about 
saving the species. I think there'll be some of us around here and there around the world for a long time to come. But whether civilization as we know it, now roughly seven billion people, can survive the, the, the mounting stresses on the system is another question. When we talk about saving civilization, it means becoming politically active. Pick an issue that's important to you. Closing coal-fired power plants? Go to work on the coal-fired power plant in your community. Um, is it population growth? Join one of the population growth that's trying to, working to fill the family planning gap around the world. Is it recycling? Then develop a world-class recycling program in your community, one that recycles and reuses almost everything. That greatly reduces energy use. Um, so pick an issue that's important to you. Find some friends, maybe, who share your concerns and interests. Organize and go to work, whether it's your city council or your elected members in, in Congress or what have you. Um, we've got, a, we've got a, a lot of work to do, and we've got to do it fast if we're going to reverse the trends that are so clearly undermining our future. We're going to have to do it together. We used to talk about national security. It's now a meaningless term. Uh, there is no national security without global security. Um, we have, here in Washington, a definition of security that we inherited from the last century. A century that was dominated by two world wars and a cold war. And so when you talk about national security here in Washington, people think about defense budget, uh, advanced weapons systems. But if I were to make a list <clears throat> of the principal threats to our future today, not in the 20th century, but in the early 21st century, on that list would be climate change, spreading water shortages, rising food prices, failing states, environmental refugees. Armed aggression wouldn't make the top five on my list. It might make the top 10. But our, no one is threatening us today with armed aggression. Terrorism is, is a problem, obviously, um, partly because we made it a problem. Um, but <clears throat> it's time to redefine security. And not only in an intellectual sense, but in a fiscal sense. When we look at the things we need to do, whether it's reforestation or filling the family planning gap, that whole package of things that we call Plan B, it comes to about $200 billion of additional expenditures per year, which seems like quite a lot. And it is. But it's less than a third of the US military budget. It's less than an eighth of the global military budget. And what we're talking about, really, with Plan B in this package of things is how to save civilization. It's hard to put a price tag on civilization. So that's, the, that's where we are. I think redefining security is, is the number one sort of policy issue um, in terms of setting priorities. And the principal instrument for bringing about the change we need is restructuring taxes, lowering income taxes, raising the carbon tax. Do you think, this is the last question, um, do you think security might become an issue as states don't have anything? They don't have water, they don't have food? Aren't they going to come and try to take the food from states that do? Like, isn't it going to be a cause for war? And <laughs> The costs of doing that will be so great that it will eventually lead to collapse in any event. Um, it's hard to win a water war, for example. Um, and with climate change, you know, it affects all of us. Um, there's only one world grain market today. I mean, we check the world grain price late each afternoon by the closing grain price on the Chicago Board of Trade. It's the principal place where grains are traded in the world, and that's where the, where the um, basically where the world price is. You don't have one price for 
for wheat in one part of the world and a, and a hugely different price in another part of the world. We're all part of the same, same economy now, the same package.